Wahhabism, if you don't mind, I'll start by, I'm sure many of you have looked up and, and maybe read books on, on Islam. But just briefly, um, in Sunnah Islam, uh, the, uh, there are four main uh, uh, clerics, if I can call them that, who uh, interpreted uh, the teachings of the Prophet and the um, uh, divine revelation of, of the Quran according to their times. And they lived uh, uh, in the range of between 100 to 200 years after the Prophet Muhammad died. So there was some time between his, uh, his life and his existence and their attempt to understand and to explain uh, the practices that he uh, uh, went, uh, went through his life and uh, also uh, the needs of the society that developed over the years that evolved from uh, the time of, of, his, uh, of his life. Uh, Al-Shafi'i, Al-Maliki, Ibn Hanbal, and Abu Hanifa were the four uh, main clerics. Um, and they left uh, 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 a um, uh, heritage of, uh, of uh, scholarship on these interpretations that were picked up by followers and te uh, students of theirs uh, from one to the other uh, till the present day. And uh, in, in that course, uh, the, uh, the, in the near mid 18th century, uh, one of the clerics in the Arabian Peninsula uh, decided to, to study more than simply what he received from um, the, uh, the, his teachers in, in, in Central Arabia, the Najd area in Riyadh and around it. And his name was Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, and he went to Medina uh, to acquire um, uh, know-how and skills from, from uh, teachers there in the, in the Prophet's mosque. But he also went to Basra uh, in Iraq, which historically has always been a center of, of scholarship and learning in Muslim uh, tradition. Um, in, in, in the Najd area, the, the, the cleric who, of these four clerics who followed generally uh, was Ibn Hanbal. And he was identified even during his time and, and after his time as uh, a, um, a, um, a very strict Unitarian in emphasizing the oneness of God and the application of, of religious duties like prayers, like almsgiving, like um, fasting and, uh, and uh, um, uh, the, uh, the other practices that were practiced by the Prophet Muhammad in his lifetime. But in, on, on issues of, of worldly life um, beyond the strict application of, of uh, uh, duty uh, in terms of prayers and fasting and so on, um, he was considered one of the more liberal uh, of the scholars, the, these four uh, scholars. And that tradition predominated in this area in, uh, in, in Arabia uh, in mid-18th uh, century. So Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab was a follower of the teachings of uh, Ibn Hanbal. And when he came back from his studies in Basra and Medina, uh, the thing that he uh, uh, began to preach for was the strict Unitarian application of uh, religious duty. Uh, and that, uh, of course, entailed his, uh, his rejection of uh, what had been acquired by social practice over the 
what from 80 from the 6th century to the 5th uh, 7th century to the um, 18th century that's about 11 centuries of social uh, practice and, and, and other um, uh, additions if you like to the original practices of the Prophet Muhammad and his immediate followers uh, things like uh, 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 grave worship for example or saints or, uh, or uh, supplication to uh, objects or people other than God. Uh, so uh, he began preaching that, uh, that course uh, of, of practice, um, which in his society at that time, in mid 18th century, all these practices were pretty much in common. Use in, in, in Central Arabia, as in other parts of the Muslim world. So, uh, and his, and he became uh, uh, very, very dedicated to uh, to applying his views uh, on on the society. His father and his brother and his grandfather were clerics as well, uh, but they accepted the social norms. Of, of the accretion of these practices that had come over the centuries uh, to the practice of, of Islam, and uh, they opposed him uh, in his uh, in his preaching. Um, uh, he was originally from a town south of, of Riyadh, uh, Maybe next time when you come, we'll take you there. Uh, but he he. He lived in, in, in a nearby village to, to, to Riyadh called Al Ayena, which is still there, still inhabited by people. And there was a ruler there who uh, accepted his teachings and gave him support. Um, and uh, he began to uh, receive uh, uh, people who, who came to hear his, his preaching. Uh, and uh, uh, his uh, views began to to uh, to spread in, in, in the surrounding villages, and that uh, led to, uh, um, as in all such uh, such happenings, uh, people objecting uh, and other people uh, fearing and some some accepting. A tribe nearby on, on the eastern coast of, of, uh, of Arabia, very strong tribe at that time, had influence in, in Central Arabia and sent word to the ruler in Al Ayena that this preacher must be stopped because they didn't accept his, uh, his teachings. So the ruler asked him to, to leave. And uh, when he did, he took refuge in a nearby a village, a Dir'iyya. I don't know if you've been to a Dir'iyya. And the ruler there was called Muhammad ibn Su'ud. Uh, and so, uh, uh, who accepted the teachings of this uh, cleric and provided him support. And they reached uh, an accord between them that Muhammad ibn Su'ud will provide protection for Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. In return, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab will be uh, uh, not only allowed but also encouraged to uh, to spread the word uh, so the uh, the mosque in uh, in a dir'iyya i don't know if you saw the ruins there or not uh, but uh, did they go to the ruins Kaisha and the or not? Yeah. Um, anyway the, the mosque there became a center for spreading the word if you like that muhammad bin abdul Wahab Taught. and people came from other places to acquire this, uh, this uh, knowledge from, uh, from him. Uh, that led to a growth in influence and Hamad bin Abdul Wahab, in, in offering protection, had to defend uh, Muhammad bin Saud, had to defend Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab uh, in, in, the, uh, in the area. Uh, towns like Riyadh, which existed then, in smaller fashion of course, uh, opposed, and there were uh, conflicts that arose, military conflicts between Muhammad bin Saud and neighboring, uh, neighboring uh, uh, 
emirs or princes or rulers of the various towns and villages in, um, in Arabia. Uh, but through good fortune, through good stewardship and, and other uh, uh, developments, uh, the, uh, the, the writ of, of Ibn Saud and Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab uh, began to expand in Central Arabia, which led to more conflict, uh, because Arabia was divided into city-states and uh, uh, on the coasts, particularly the western coast of the Red Sea and the eastern coast in the eastern province, uh, the, the Ottoman Empire at that time was the main arbiter, if you like, uh, if not necessarily direct ruler, but they had uh, a lot of influence in the area. And they opposed any innovative or different interpretations and the ones that they allowed for themselves in Istanbul and in other places in the Ottoman Empire. And as this, the, the influence of Ibn Saud and Ibn Muhammad, uh, Muhammad and Abdul Wahab spread, the, uh, the Ottomans uh, delegated to, the, to their governors, in, first in Baghdad uh, and then subsequently at a later stage in Egypt, to deal with these upstarts that began to spread this, uh, this so-called, as they interpreted, new creed. Uh, in fact, it was not a new creed, but it was a direct descendant of the teachings of Ibn Hanbal from several centuries uh, before. Uh, and so, uh, in that effort, and to discredit the, uh, the, this new, according to their own interpretation, uh, uh, a sect, uh, they uh, defined it as a new sect and a new, uh, a new uh, religion, if you like. Um, they uh, uh, considered it a, a heresy, the Ottomans did, and uh, uh, sanctioned opposition to it from anybody who would come forward and oppose it. And in that context, um, because Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab was the main teacher of this uh, new interpretation of, of Islam. They tried to stigmatize it by, by calling it Wahhabism uh, from the name Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab and issued decrees and, and religious fatwas from Istanbul, which was the center of the Islamic uh, world at that time, uh, and the caliphate. Uh, denouncing this uh, this uh, heresy, as, as as they called it, and calling upon faithful Muslims to rise up against it and, and oppose it. In that context, of course, uh, and uh, going forward a little bit, uh, the the Ibn Saud and 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 uh, Ibn Abdul Wahab managed to expand their their, their, uh, their influence and their control over practically all of the Arabian Peninsula, including the holy places in Mecca and, and Medina. And from there, of course, those two places provided a huge pulpit for, for this interpretation of Islam that Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab uh, began to spread and to teach people came from East and West because they come for the pilgrimage and uh, through trade and other things, people going out from there to other places, spread the word, etc. So the Ottomans then, having not gotten much out of the governor of Baghdad against them, uh, designated that, that uh, role to the governor in Egypt. Uh, whose name is Muhammad Ali. I don't know if any of you read the history of Egypt, but he's supposed to be the founder of modern Egypt uh, at that time. And he launched military campaigns against the, uh, the Al Sauds uh, at that time and managed to succeed in, eventually in, in defeating uh, the, this first Saudi state and Dir'iya, which was the capital, uh, was actually uh, raised by cannon fire. Uh, uh, and uh, the then head of the Saudi state uh, was the, uh, 
a great grandson of the first uh, Muhammad bin Saud, and also the great grandson of Sheikh Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, who had uh, uh, succeeded uh, in the leadership of, of the religious authority here, were taken to Istanbul and executed there as heretics. And from there, the so-called Wahhabi stigma uh, became attached to this uh, Unitarian uh, uh, creed that uh, Sheikh Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab preached and which had gained a lot of support, not only in Arabia, but as I mentioned, people came from India, from the Muslim community there, from North Africa, uh, even from as far away as, as the Ottoman uh, uh, states in, in, in Central Europe and, and in the Caucasus, etc. Uh, and so uh, the, that uh, conflict against Wahhabism uh, began at that time. And the, the, the negative uh, impressions about Wahhabism developed from those days. But when you look at the teachings of Sheikh Muhammad bin Abdul Waha, they don't differ at all in letter or in word or in spirit from uh, the teachings of Ibn Hanbal, who was accepted and has been accepted as one of the four main uh, interpreters of Islam, Sunni Islam, uh, throughout uh, history. And, uh, with the rise of, of the third Saudi state in 1902, uh, uh, established by King Abdulaziz, um, there were attempts also at that time to revive the stigma of so-called Wahhabism. Uh, but because of King Abdulaziz uh, was uh, a, uh, a, a, a capable uh, uh, ruler and uh, and personality, um, he uh, invited people to come and see for themselves what the practices were. And when he acquired the rulership of Mecca and Medina in 1924 from another uh, Arabian dynasty at the time, the Hashemites, I'm sure you've heard of them, they rule now in Jordan. Um, the uh, one of the first things he did was to hold a, uh, a, a debate between Negdi clerics that came with him and the local uh, Mecca and Medina clerics uh, to see if there are any differences uh, between the interpretation of Islam. And both uh, parties uh, came to an agreement which was uh, signed by both parties as accepting each other, as being within the, the fold of, of Islam. So there is new, no new sect being introduced, uh, so-called Wahhabi or otherwise, into the fold of Islamic, uh, Sunni Islamic uh, interpretation of, of Islam. Now, um, definitely uh, within the context of, of the followers of the original teachings of Sheikh Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab uh, in Central Arabia and subsequently in, in modern day Saudi Arabia, uh, there were individuals who um, went beyond the teachings and developed their own uh, uh, views of, of those teachings, particularly when it came to issues of, uh, of, uh, of uh, jihad, uh, which is struggle against the enemy, uh, and uh, the, uh, the practices of, uh, of Islam, uh, the devotion and, and the piety of, of society, like uh, the veil and the, uh, the beard and uh, the, the physical attributes of what a Muslim should be. Uh, and uh, to be brief, uh, the, the, in modern day Muslim practice, uh, the, uh, uh, the, those who went beyond the teachings of Sheikh Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab 
which you must remember were also the teachings of Ibn Hanbal, the original uh, one of the four clerics that I told you about, um, developed their own ideas. And these ideas were nurtured uh, in, in societies like Egypt, for example, where uh, those practices were, uh, were condemned uh, by the state. And those who promoted these uh, zealous uh, interpretations of, uh, of Islam in general uh, were either imprisoned or executed for uh, either treason or for upsetting the, the social order uh, in, in those countries. Uh, in that framework, uh, of course, that developed a, uh, uh, an underground movement in some of the uh, social I hope I'm going correctly on this. <laughs> he, he is my spiritual guide. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, in, in, the, in, in 1979, if you remember, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. And the, uh, the struggle against the, the Soviet invasion was acquired the name of the Jihad. So uh, you had uh, Afghans fighting the Soviet army uh, and they're being identified as, uh, as jihadis by media around the world, including in the Muslim world. And a whole host of, 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 of Muslim volunteers from everywhere came to help the Mujahideen at that time against the, the Soviet invasion. Uh, they were basically uh, established and based in, on, on the Pakistani side of the border with Afghanistan in places like Peshawar and Quetta. And uh, they are developed in those uh, Mujahideen camps, uh, mostly for refugees from, from Afghanistan. Uh, a, uh, an interaction between these volunteers that came from around the world with their own ideas of what the jihad should be, what uh, the, uh, the, uh, the conflict with the Soviets, uh, how it should be dealt with, etc., etc. And in that context, uh, three uh, persons came together at that time in, in, in Peshawar this is the early 80s, after the Soviet invasion. One of them was a Saudi called Muhammad bin Laden. Abdullah bin Laden, um, no, sorry, uh, Osama bin Laden. And he's a Saudi, from prominent at that time family, commercial family here, who left the university uh, where he was studying engineering and went and volunteered to help the Mujahideen. Uh, the other one was a doctor from Egypt called uh, Ayman al Bawahari, uh, whose background uh, is uh, Muslim Brotherhood from Egypt, but going beyond Muslim Brotherhood uh, practices and developing his own uh, very zealous and very extreme uh, view of, of, of Islam and how Muslims should conduct themselves, and who is a Muslim and who is not a Muslim. And the third person was called Abdullah Azam, also Muslim Brotherhood, but from Palestine. And uh, interestingly, uh, his uh, view of jihad, uh, being a Palestinian, um, was not to go and, and, and liberate Palestine from Israeli occupation, because he considered that the, the other Palestinian parties involved in the struggle against Israel uh, as being un-Islamic. Uh, so in his view, the, the opposition to, to, uh, to uh, occupiers or invaders or colonists from other religions and other ethnicities uh, should be done by purely Islamic uh, forces and not accept communists or socialists or nationalists in that view. So he considered the then uh, PLO under Yasser Arafat as being uh, idolatrous. Uh, 
Uh, and so he moved his personality and his view of the world to Afghanistan, where he saw the struggle there as being between Muslims, the Afghan Mujahideen, and non-Muslims, the Soviet uh, forces, and the Afghan communists who depended on these Soviet forces. And when they got together in Afghanistan, uh, the, they began to, to work together to develop um, a base for receiving all these volunteers that were coming from the Muslim world, uh, to provide them with services, to provide them with advice on how to, to uh, uh, exist and, and, and survive in that uh, very difficult area of, of Peshawar. Uh, and uh, and uh, not only uh, economically, but also uh, if they started uh, from from this building that they established, which they called the base uh, in Arabic Al Qaeda, um, and uh, give some some sort of, of uh, uh, help and 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 other aid to to these volunteers. They offered their services to the Mujahideen uh, as fighters. But the Mujahideen always, the Afghan Mujahideen, were very careful to keep as much as possible uh, non-Afghans away from the military operations. Uh, they considered them to be a burden on themselves if they went into Afghanistan, language, ethnicity, etc social custom, so they preferred them to provide only humanitarian aid to themselves and kept them in these camps in Peshawar and, and, and Quetta to provide these uh, humanitarian services for them, including Bin Laden and Ayman al-Dawahri and uh, Abdullah al -Zan. But when the, finally the Mujahideen managed to repel the, the Soviet invasion, um, the Mujahideen themselves began to fight each other between different factions, uh, mostly based, based on tribal, uh, tribal differences, Pashtuns against, uh, uh, against other uh, tribal uh, groupings in, in Afghanistan. And Abdullah Azam and Ayman al-Dawahri and, and uh, Bin Laden um, were pulled to, to, uh, to support one or the other of these Mujahideen uh, uh, former colleagues who began to fight each other. So there was uh, friction growing uh, between them. One of the results of that was uh, the assassination of Abdullah Azam by one of the Mujahideen uh, groups that he opposed uh, at that time. Uh, but Bin Laden and, and Ayman al-Bawari uh, managed to keep themselves together and to keep themselves uh, from harm's way uh, of the Mujahideen struggle by offering to help both sides uh, in that case through volunteers or through financial support. And, and Bin Laden, of course, had financial resources that of his own, but he also managed to collect from, from people who knew his family and were willing to contribute money and so on. With that developed Bin Laden's ambition in, uh, in liberating, if you like, uh, the Muslim world from foreign inter interference and foreign occupation. Uh, he took up the mantle of uh, anti-colonialism in, in, in those years, identified in the occupation by Israel of Palestine and by American support for Israel uh, in occupying uh, Palestine. So he, by, this is going into the 90s now. Uh, the, uh, the first public declaration by, by Bin Laden uh, and Ayman al-Dawahari uh, in identifying who they are as, as the Al-Qaeda the first declaration dealt with how they were devoting themselves to the struggle against the, uh, the American Zionist uh, conspiracy against the, uh, the Muslim world.
And from there, uh, they also identified that the Americans and the, and the Zionists had Muslim supporters. So they opposed these Muslim supporters and identified these Muslim supporters uh, as being hypocrites uh, and must be uh, fought along with the American and the Zionist uh, uh, forces. Uh, and uh, because coinc coincidentally by 1990, we had the, the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait and the kingdom's call for the international community to come and help to, so, to oppose this invasion of Kuwait. American forces were deployed in Saudi Arabia, British forces were deployed, French forces, forces from all over the world, including from Arab and Muslim countries, came to the kingdom to oppose the, uh, the uh, Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. And the, uh, uh, that became uh, point of, 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 of difference and conflict between Bin Laden and Saudi Arabia, because he felt that the presence of these American forces and other European and non-Muslim forces was desecrating the Holy Land of the Arabian Peninsula and the two Holy Mosques. So he began to preach in, in in, when he came back to Arabia after leaving Afghanistan in 1990-1991 in uh, some of the mosques in, in Jeddah where he, he lived and against the, the presence of the American forces in, in Arabia. And the authorities at the time uh, of course brought him in and questioned him and uh, didn't imprison him but simply uh, uh, warned him not to continue uh, to preach. By 1993, by, uh, yes, 1993, um, he decided to leave uh, Arabia. And first he went to, uh, to uh, Afghanistan, back in Afghanistan, where he found that the civil war between the Afghans would not allow him to operate there. So he moved from there to, to, to uh, the Sudan. A Sudan at the time had espoused a policy of supporting revolutionary movements around the world. And uh, there was a gentleman in the Sudan called Hassan Turabi uh, who had uh, 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 ambitions to make the Sudan uh, the center of international revolutionary forces and uh, they managed to bring together in the Sudan uh, the whole spectrum of rev revolutionary movements around the world for a meeting there to help coordinate their, their opposition to the neo-imperialist forces that they identified as being America and her supporters not only in Europe and otherwise, other uh, else place, but also in, in the Middle East. Um, if you can imagine, yeah, any people like uh, um, the Tupumaros from, from Latin America, the uh, Shining Path, uh, the Red Army group from, from, from Japan, um, Bin Laden and his Al-Qaeda people, uh, the jihad group from Egypt, uh, the Palestinian uh, Marxist uh, um, factions like the PFLP and the PFLP General Command, etc., etc. They all came together in Khartoum and were provided with uh, sustenance and support by, by the Sudanese government at that time, including the famous uh, Chacal, as the French call him, Carlos, uh, who had uh, been instrumental in, in hijacking uh, OPEC oil ministers in the 70s. I don't know if you remember him or not. Maybe he was still not born at that time. But uh, he was a very famous revolutionary Marxist, from originally from Venezuela, but uh, brought his struggle against imperialism to the Middle East and used to work with the uh, Red Brigades in Italy and the, the other European Marxist groups uh, in 
in the 70s in, in Europe, in Germany, and in France, and in other places. So, Bin Laden was in the midst of all of these things, and his ideas, of course, were uh, continually evolving into how to oppose the Zionist American uh, conspiracy and those in the Middle East who, in his view, were in that league. And that included Saudi Arabia. Uh, the Sudan became, uh, after two years of, of having all of these revolutionary groups in, in the Sudan, um, they, uh, and there was pressure being put on them. Uh, America put the Sudan on its, on its uh, terrorist list uh, of countries supporting terrorism and sanctioning them, and uh, eventually uh, the United Nations itself sanctioned uh, Sudan. So uh, the Sudanese began to, to, to try to rid themselves of these groups. And one of the things they did was uh, they handed over Carlos to, to the French because he had committed a terrorist act in Paris and he was on their wanted list in Paris. So he, Carlos is now still in jail in, in, uh, in, in France. And Bin Laden was offered to Saudi Arabia by the uh, then president of, of the Sudan, uh, but he put a condition on, re on releasing him to, to Saudi Arabia. This is 1995 or so. Uh, and that condition was that Saudi Arabia would not prosecute him. And of course, the leadership here said no way, I and mean, nobody here is above the law. So if you're going to give him to us, we're going to take him to court, because he had already committed uh, uh, terrorist acts in the kingdom in 1995, particularly here in Riyadh with the explosion of a car bomb in front of one of the National Guard buildings in the center of Riyadh. So he was wanted here for, for that act. Um, and Bin Laden, having felt that the Sudanese government wanted to get rid of him, <coughs> he took off from, from there and went back to Afghanistan, where he sought refuge with some of his old friends from jihad, Mujahideen days in, in, against the Soviets uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan. In the meantime, in Afghanistan itself, the civil war was coming to a climax with the the new introduction of a new element in Afghanistan, uh, other than the Mujahideen forces at that time, and this new element was called the Taliban. Uh, the Taliban grew out of the Mujahideen uh, forces, but they were not beholden to any of the Mujahideen leaders, in, uh, in either in Pakistan or in, in, in Afghanistan. And they developed their own uh, momentum and uh, and spread their influence in Afghanistan to the extent where by 1996 uh, and early 1997 they managed to control nearly I would say 80 percent of Afghanistan uh, with just a, a small enclave of opponents in the northeast uh, opposing them. They occupied the capital and, and other places in, in, in Afghanistan and sought, began to, to seek international recognition. And the kingdom offered them recognition, not only in order, be, because they controlled most of Afghanistan and the capital, but also to keep in touch with what is happening in Afghanistan. Uh, and the Taliban, uh, at that time, were very friendly to, to Saudi Arabia, but by Occupying all of Afghanistan, they also inherited the presence of Bin Laden from one of the Mujahideen groups that had given him refuge in 1996 when he left uh, Sudan. And in that uh, issue, of course, the kingdom warned the Taliban that Bin Laden is wanted here, and if they wanted to give him refuge, then they must make sure that he doesn't do anything against the kingdom. And they gave us assurances that they would do that. Unfortunately, he kept on <laughs> operating against the kingdom. And we kept on pressing the Taliban to, uh, to, to stop 
from from uh, doing harm to the kingdom, either in, in media or actually in supporting terrorist acts and trying to smuggle weapons and, and other uh, dangerous things into the kingdom. By 1998, his uh, opposition to the kingdom was so flagrantly open that and the Taliban had not kept their word to us to keep him from, from operating against us. Uh, I was sent by, by, by the king to, to meet with the then leader of the Taliban, Mullah Omar, to convince him to hand over Bin Laden to us. So in June 1998, I went to Kandahar, met with Mullah Omar, who, as I mentioned, at that time the Taliban were very friendly to Saudi Arabia, received me graciously, and uh, we reached an agreement that we would set up a joint committee between the, the Taliban and the kingdom uh, to uh, look into the, uh, the uh, uh, judicial issues of their releasing Bin Laden to us, uh, because they had given him refuge before that. Uh, and this committee was supposed to meet soon after uh, I left Afghanistan uh, and decide on, on that issue. Uh, by July uh, 2000, uh, 1998, Mullah Omar sent an envoy to assure our leadership that he was working on setting up this committee, uh, and uh, we told him we're ready any time that they are. In August of that year, um, the embassy bombings in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam took place, U.S. embassy bombings. And they were clearly Bin Laden uh, uh, acts. And so uh, then President Clinton issued uh, an ultimatum to the Taliban, you deliver Bin Laden or we're going to take action. Uh, the Taliban insisted that they have to go through a judicial process of proving that Bin Laden uh, did the deed and so on. Clinton being under investigation at the time and the threat of, uh, of uh, you know, being thrown out of the White House by the Republicans at that time, he, uh, he decided to take action against the Taliban and sent missiles and so on to bomb um, Kandahar where Bin Laden had his camp. Uh, of course, Bin Laden was nowhere in that camp at that time because the Americans had already you know, said we're going to do that. So uh, he, uh, he survived the, the bombing. Uh, but for us, of course, it complicated the issue with the Taliban. Uh, and so in September of that year, I was sent back to, to Kandahar to remind uh, Mr. Uh, Mullah Omar of his promise to set up the committee to deliver Bin Laden to us. And when I went there this time, uh, Mullah Omar was a different person. Uh, he was not so gracious. He was very, very uh, uh, abrasive in his talk and uh, telling me that we shouldn't prosecute this man who is under threat by American uh, military force, etc. Instead of prosecuting him and persecuting him, you should work with him to oppose the uh, imperialist Americans and so on, etc. So I simply got up and said, Mr. Omar, what you are doing is going to bring harm, not just to you personally, but it's going to bring harm to Afghanistan. And I said, I'm going to leave now, and when I uh, go home, I'm going to recommend that we break relations with, with you and you will have to suffer the consequences of your actions. Unfortunately, they never delivered the Laden to us, so um, we broke relations with them. And uh, ever since that time, the Taliban have been on our blacklist because of their support for Al-Qaeda. Uh, this is a historical background. I hope I didn't take too long in explaining it. But from Al-Qaeda, other extremist groups in the area began to form. And with the American invasion of, of, of Iraq, that allowed for similar extremist and, and terrorist uh, groups uh, to, to come together. And 
the conduit for these uh, groups to go into Iraq to oppose the American invasion were from two places. From Syria, which had engaged some of these people to go to Iraq to oppose the American invasion because the Syrians then were afraid that the Americans would invade Syria as well. And from Iran. Uh, when the Taliban were bombed by America and Afghanistan uh, became a uh, place of, of, of insecurity for the Taliban uh, and for Bin Laden, uh, Al-Qaeda uh, elements from, from Afghanistan fled to, to Iran. And the Iranians took them in and put them in, in safe houses and kept them under their control there, including some of Bin Laden's uh, own family, and they're still there uh, to, uh, to today. Uh, so some of these also extremist uh, groups and personalities came into Iraq from, uh, from, uh, from Iran. And they began to fight the American occupation in, uh, in, uh, in, in Iraq. Uh, people uh, like uh, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, I don't know if you've heard his name or not, uh, he took up the mantle, if you like, of setting up Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, and he developed a system there for, for their existence, recruiting uh, people uh, to uh, fight the American presence in, uh, in, in Iraq. Um, the Iraqi, uh, the American forces, uh, in the meantime, had also succeeded in either jailing or eliminating some of these uh, individuals uh, and uh, groups in, in Iraq, and uh, uh, one of those who was eventually uh, eliminated in Iraq was Abu Musab al-Sarqawi through a bombing campaign that the Americans succeeded in identifying his, uh, his location and sending a bomb to, to kill him. But one of the people who was incarcerated in the American jails in, 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 uh, in Iraq uh, was uh, al-Baghdadi, who became subsequently the, the head of the so-called Islamic State of uh, Islamic State. And in the in the uh, in the camps that where he was in prison, he he met up with uh, with former Saddam uh, officers uh, of, of his security forces and so on, and struck up. Uh, uh, a deal with them to work together once they left uh, jail. Uh, and it's curious and very interesting that the way they left the prison was when the then newly elected Prime Minister of, of, of Iraq, Nouri al-Maliki, came into power, and when was it, 2003, I think, or 2005, um, he released these prisoners. Uh, obviously, for I think, more for 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 uh, practical purposes, like you know, these were American um, uh, uh, prisoners, and uh, why should we pay for their existence? And, and so Al Baghdadi was released with other former Baptist uh, security and and military uh, groups uh, from from these jails. and they went into Syria to operate and to come together and revive. The, the development of Al-Qaeda in Baghdad to become the Islamic State first in, Baghdad, in, in Iraq and subsequently purely the Islamic State. Now, they, of course, decided to carry on not just the military campaign against the Americans, but also to, uh, to declare themselves as being the Islamic State. Uh, the caliphate, the, the successor to the long history of, of uh, Islamic empires that ruled uh, much of the world in their time after the death of the Prophet. And the, the last one, of course, was the Ottoman Empire. And the caliphate was abolished in 1924 by then Ataturk in, in Turkey. This attitude and this ambition, uh, of course, targeted not just American and European and non-Muslim uh, uh, groups and people and, and, and armies and so on, uh, 
but also Muslims who disagree with that. So if you look at, at in terms of numbers, the, uh, the Muslim victims of, uh, of uh, Al-Qaeda and subsequently uh, Daesh uh, or the Islamic State uh, far outnumber any other numbers uh, from non-Muslim faiths or uh, other nationalities than, than Arab and, uh, and uh, Middle Eastern nationalities. And their, their philosophical interpretation of Islam differs 180 degrees from the teachings of Sheikh Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab. Uh, as an example, just a few examples to give you the, where the differences are. Um, the issue of the caliphate. Sheikh Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab never called for, for a caliphate. Rather, he, 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 his teachings were, were always concentrated on, on the, the, the practices of, of, the, of the religious duties of Muslims and the discarding of, as I mentioned to you earlier, of the long history of accretion <coughs> of in his view, non-acceptable pra uh, practices to Islam, like the worship of graves or saints or other such uh, practices. Another difference, of course, is the, the, the call for the jihad. In Sheikh Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab's interpretation, which comes from the long history of Islamic tradition that he inherited from Sheikh uh, the cleric Ahmed bin Hanbal and the accepted norms of the other teachers of Islam, uh, in, in Sunni Islam, um, the jihad can only be called by uh, a leader of the community, meaning either a government or a king or an imam of, of that uh, community. You and I cannot, cannot just go out in the streets and say, come on, let's go to the jihad. That is not acceptable. And anyone who adheres to that call uh, is considered to be a sinner because there is a a hierarchical structure for the call to the jihad that uh, the, uh, the, the Daesh interpretation, of course, they gave themselves that right, although nobody recognized them, including the society they were living in, as being leaders of, of that uh, community. Um, the third thing, of course, is what is called in the new interpretation that these groups follow, uh, a tawahush, the philosophy of a tawahush derived from a book written by a cleric some 30 years ago, I think, or so, originally from Jordan, but he was uh, in Saudi Arabia for some time, and then he was in other areas in the Islamic world, which uh, sanctions um, uh, brutalization as a means of establishing authority. So uh, they espouse this uh, interpretation and hence we see their you know cutting off of the heads uh, the uh, burning of, 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 of opponents in, in, in rooms alive uh, the throwing of opponents from rooftops etc all of the the, the, the vicious and, and brutal acts they, they sanction them and of course this is runs completely counter to what the teachings of Sheikh Muhammad and Abdul Muhammad emphasize, which is the respect for, for, for the human soul as Islam recognizes and the practices of, of Muslim, Muslims throughout the uh, historic uh, interpretation of Islam has been. These are just three of the differences between the so-called teachings of Sheikh Muhammad and Abdul Wahab and, and Daesh and, and ISIS uh, in there. And there are other differences. Uh, I remember yeah, uh, in some of the commentaries that have come out to, uh, to try to link Daesh to, uh, to Saudi Arabia and to, uh, to the teachings of Sheikh Muhammad and Abdul Wahab that in the schools that Daesh established that they teach Saudi textbooks. And that may be the case, but these textbooks never sanctioned these kinds of, of, of uh, interpretations of, of Islam. They merely concentrated on 
how um, the, the practice of, of, of the prayers and the fasting and so on are. And I tell my, my interlocutors who question me on, on this issue that, well, if you take, for example, the Ku Klux Klan in America, they use the Bible <laughs> as, as a textbook for their own uh, actions and to justify their, uh, their actions and other interpretations like that. In, if you look in, in, uh, in, in some of the acts that take place in India, for example, uh, some of the religious, uh, religiously based or uh, attempts to give them religious authority by either Hindu or, or, or Buddhist uh, practitioners. So what's happening in, in Rohingya, in, in Myanmar, by, by Buddhist uh, uh, monks against uh, non-Buddhist uh, communities there. They also try to use religious texts for their own purpose. So I hope this covers some of your uh, issues. Do you have anything to add? Uh, maybe just um, thank you, Hans, for, for this informative narrative. I just want to emphasize two points that, that you made in, in your talk, which is the first one, I mean, you highlighted the origin of the word Wahhabism. Yeah. Um, and this is important because people do not recognize that this term, uh, people who um, uh, identify themselves with the teaching of uh, Muhammad al Wahhab, they don't use this term to identify themselves. So they do, the, the adjective Wahhabi or Wahhabism is actually has uh, it actually has a kind of a derogatory uh, connotation for the people who identify with the teaching. So even we, if we, uh, like for convenience, opt for using the term, we should recognize that the, it's not, it's actually a term that was coined by the opponent of the movement. Um, so uh, and the other, maybe going back to Saudi Arabia, I mean, uh, the discussion bringing back to Saudi Arabia, uh, also a common mistake is that, um, Often, Saudi Arabia is reduced to uh, the teaching of Muhammad Abdul Wahab and only seen through this lens. Of course, it's foundational, but uh, the society has also diversity and has also uh, other aspects beyond the strict only religious lens. So this is kind of, of course, I mean, you've been around in the kingdom, you've seen it's like, just like any other society, there is the religion is, is, is one aspect, an a very important aspect in this case, but it's only one aspect. Uh, and, and even within the religious uh, realm, uh, you will also see diversity. For example, there is in the highest religious, official religious authority in the kingdom, the Committee for Senior Ulama, you will find a Maliki a sheikh who is not, who is not humbly, like, um, such as Qaisa Mubarak, for example. So also we need to the teaching of Muhammad al Wahhab is foundational uh, to, to the country, but also we need to teach and uh, to, to see the diversity um, uh, within. And that's just. May, just would you mind giving them a background of who you are? Oh, <laughs> I'm actually a researcher here at uh, King Faisal Center and also a PhD uh, student in sociology in the University of Illinois uh, under Urbana Champaign. You're from Illinois? Chicago, yeah. My yeah. parents are. Oh, close. <laughs> okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, Your Highness, thank you for this speech. It was really understandable and great to hear from someone who actually participated in this whole process. If you allow me a sure. very like controversial question, you often hear in the news about state-sponsored uh, terrorism by Saudi Arabia. What do you say to those allegations? Well, I'll give you a controversial answer, if you don't mind. <laughs> um, the kingdom has been a victim of terrorist uh, activity, not just recently. Uh, if you look at, uh, at the, uh, the development of, of terrorism in the Middle East, uh, in the 50s and 60s and 70s, uh, and perhaps part of the 80s as well, uh, that was uh, basically practiced by um, uh, leftist communist parties in, uh, in, the, in the Middle East, most of them 
being from the Palestinian uh, groups that existed at that time, uh, like the PFLP, uh, Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, uh, General, uh, uh, General Command, etc. Uh, Abu Nidal group, uh, I don't know if you remember them or not. These were all mo mostly philosophically uh, leftist, uh, Marxist-oriented groups. And uh, they considered at that time Saudi Arabia as being an enemy because of our uh, identifying themselves as a Muslim state, because they opposed such uh, uh, an identification and because we were allies with the United States and with other Western uh, countries in, in the struggle against international communism at the time. Uh, so um, uh, Saudi embassies were, were, were attacked uh, in Khartoum, for example, the Saudi embassy was attacked during a, a National Day celebration and the then uh, American ambassador was one of the guests and he was assassinated in the Saudi embassy by one of these groups. Uh, our embassy in, in, uh, in, in Paris was equally attacked and hostages were taken, uh, Saudi hostages, and etc. used for, for uh, uh, blackmail, etc. So the kingdom has been a victim of that. And when the so-called Islamist groups began to form in, in, in the Arab world, starting with uh, Egypt was the, the, the country where um, the initial stages of that, uh, of that uh, movement began uh, under Sadat, uh, starting from the time when he signed uh, his peace agreement with Israel, of course, and it led to his assassination, basically. Uh, so uh, um, that uh, the kingdom became a victim afterwards because of Bin Laden uh, and the Al-Qaeda. And I remember when he, um, uh, he was still uh, not yet a declared opponent of the kingdom and having um, uh, considered himself to have contributed to the Afghan Mujahideen victory against the Soviet uh, forces in, in Afghanistan, in 1989, before the Soviets withdrew from Afghanistan, but it was quite apparent that they were going to withdraw from Afghanistan. Um, he came to see me. I was then director of intelligence uh, in, in the kingdom. And uh, he said, you know, now, and I'm quoting him, now that we have succeeded, we have succeeded, in identifying himself as being one of those taking credit for uh, the... Uh, removal of Soviet forces from Afghanistan. Now that we have succeeded to expel the Soviets from, from Afghanistan, uh, I'm proposing to you that we should also try to uh, expel the Soviets from the then South Yemen. South Yemen was then an independent country that uh, had Marxist, um, uh, declared Marxist uh, identity uh, and uh, very closely allied with the Soviet Union at that time. And uh, the kingdom at that time was going through a period of trying to reach out to the leadership in South Yemen politically and economically and so on. So uh, I told him, you know, uh, this is not the time to do that and uh, uh, perhaps, uh, let's say, yeah, he, uh, don't call us, we'll call you, basically. Uh, and so he went away. Uh, a year later, in 1990, when, uh, when the Iraqis invaded Kuwait, um, he didn't come to me at that time. He went to uh, a higher official than me, the then uh, the defense minister, the late Prince Sultan, uh, and uh, also told uh, then Prince Sultan, um, don't, please don't call on... on, on on uh, uh, infidels uh, to come and, and, uh, and help us in repelling uh, Saddam Hussein from Kuwait. Uh, I can bring my, my Afghan uh, supporters and we, as we succeeded in, in driving out the Soviets from, from Afghanistan, we will drive out the, the, the Saddam forces from, from Kuwait. 
And basically, then Prince Sultan told him the same thing. Yani, this is not the time for you to do that. And don't call us, we'll call you. And that's when I think Bin Laden turned against the kingdom and uh, began to agitate and, and so on against us. So um, the kingdom has always been the victim of, uh, of these uh, groups. And uh, uh, the, the, the contributions, financial and otherwise, that went from the kingdom to various uh, Islamic institutions, whether schools or, or, or mosques throughout the world, always began with a request from those communities uh, to Saudi Arabia for financial aid. Uh, so it, it was not the kingdom initiating these uh, financial contributions to these communities, but rather receiving requests from them to, to do that. And normally what would happen then was the kingdom would look into the condition of whether it is a mosque or a school or a hospital or any of the other requests that came to them and provide uh, the, the financial aid with the knowledge of the local government. Uh, the kingdom never uh, used uh, under the table or secretive ways of providing support for these communities. It was always with the knowledge and in, in most cases with the approval of the of the local uh, governor, governor uh, government and authorities uh, unfortunately uh, groups that espoused extremist views like the muslim brotherhood uh, were usually the ones that those communities and governments turned to to provide either the, the mosque imam or the, uh, the, the teacher or perhaps even a doctor to work at the hospital and so on because they were available and, and they had the, the technical know-how uh, to provide that kind of, uh, of, uh, of support. Uh, but I remember, for example, after 2001, um, I, I was in America in, in February to attend the World Economic Forum um, in, in New York at that time. And I was called by, by the late uh, Senator, um, he just signed, uh, I'm having one of my Alzheimer's moments. <laughs> McCain. Senator McCain, yeah, um, uh, to, uh, to the Senate with, a, with an American friend of mine. And I sat with him and he said, you know, your highness, the kingdom must stop providing aid to the madrasas uh, that provide uh, extremist uh, ideology and so on and so on. So I said, Senator, I assure you that the kingdom will be happy to work with you if you give me a list of the, of the, of of the so-called madrasas that, uh, that uh, you say we, we support, I'm sure my government will be happy to, to stop that because whoever operates in extremist uh, milieu operates against us. So he turned to his, uh, to his uh, staff and he said, give uh, the prince uh, a list of the, of the madrasas. And as I left the office and his staff member was walking me out uh, of the building, I turned to him and I said, please, uh, when can you give me this, uh, this list? And in, without even blinking an eye, uh, he turned to me and he said, your highness, I'm sorry, that, that list is confidential. <laughs> I said, what do you mean confidentially? And the senator just told you to, uh, to give me uh, the list. But my interpretation of that was that they didn't have the names of, of of these schools, that it was just uh, a, a piece of information that had come either from a source or from some intelligence agency or, or something like that. And believe me, and until today, if anybody can bring evidence to the kingdom of either financial uh, or, or in, in kind uh, support that goes to any group that has uh, uh, extremist uh, ideology and so on,
not only would we stop that that support going there, but we'd also prosecute the uh, the people who, who provide that uh, that uh, that support. Um, did you go to Mohammed bin Naif? Uh, We're going after this. After this, uh, you'll see some of the the activities that the kingdom takes with trying to rehabilitate um, people who have been exposed to extremist views uh, in, from the kingdom. Uh, and they will show you that, that the kingdom is, is totally dedicated to, to opposing uh, these ideologies. So it, it would not be in our, in our, not only our interest, but also in our philosophy to, uh, to support uh, uh, any group or, or, or a function or anything like that that could lead to terrorism. Yes, sir. I'll to ask another mildly controversial question. Okay. Um, but could you give us a sense of what the conversation in Saudi Arabia was before, during, and after 9-11? <laughs> That's going back some time. Um, I remember I was still in, 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 in my intelligence uh, uh, work, uh, he heading the intelligence service. And uh, uh, this was, uh, of course, a post uh, uh, embassy bombings uh, and other activities uh, post the bombing here in Riyadh of, of the National Guard building that I told you about by Al Qaeda, and and everybody's antennas were were up uh, for uh, for for potential um, terrorist acts by by Al Qaeda particularly. Was, at that time, it was the main. Uh, the main arm of, of, of terrorism against the world community. And uh, I remember in the summer of uh, 2001, um, with the new administration coming in in America, um, uh, Mr. Bush, of course, having uh, succeeded Mr. Clinton, um, there was a lot of static in the intelligence uh, community about a, a terrorist act that is going to be undertaken. Uh, but no, no definitive uh, uh, information on where, when, and, and how. Um, uh, CIA, Saudi intelligence, European intelligence services, other Arab uh, intelligence communities all shared that, that, that anxiety that was building. Uh, at, at that time. But unfortunately, no one managed to get a, a lead uh, as to where and when and how. Uh, and so that was how it was before. Uh, once the act was taken, of course, and the, uh, the, uh, the Twin Towers were, uh, were brought down, my first reaction having retired just a few days before the, the act um, at that time was that it was Serbian uh, people who, who did it. Because if you remember, Kosovo had just been um, taken away from, from Serbia because of American uh, armed intervention. Um, and I thought at that time Fortunately, uh, that unfortunately, that uh, Al Qaeda was not sophisticated enough to, to do that. It turned out subsequently, of course, that they didn't have to be that sophisticated. Uh, that it really was a very, um, a very uh, basic operation, uh, etc. Anyway, uh, that was my initial interpretation. Of course, once it came about about the reality, it was clearly identified as Al-Qaeda and Bin Laden doing it, and he even took credit for it. So we don't have to question that. Uh, but uh, in, in the general uh, atmosphere, not just in Saudi Arabia, but I think in, in the Muslim world, there was a great shock, uh, as it was in other places, that such a, a horrific uh, and bloody act could be undertaken uh, by people who professed 
to be Muslims. And that challenged all of our um, assumptions about ourselves. Uh, that some of our people could be so so inhuman as to to commit uh, such a horrific uh, uh, and and uh, bloody uh, act. Uh, uh, so that was the, imme the immediate after uh, reaction by the general, I think, uh, uh, people in not just in Saudi Arabia but in other uh, countries as well, and. Uh, of course, and governments subsequent to that, and particularly the Saudi government, began a process of not only identifying potential um, uh, sympathizers or maybe people who would accept such uh, an act uh, to, to take place, and also re-evaluating our discourse to ourselves, whether in mosques, or in schools, in media, etc., and trying to identify if there are any particular um, uh, uh, inclinations uh, in any of those uh, fields uh, to uh, uh, justify or to promote or to any, and uh, taking action to rectify the school, school curricula, uh, messages on the media, whether it is, in those days there was no social media, of course, it was mostly television, radio, um, and billboards. Uh, so billboards were used to denounce terrorism, etc. And uh, go on from there and, and learn from, from, from experience. Of course, a couple of years after September 11th, uh, FIDA began very extensive terrorist campaign in the kingdom, uh, bombing uh, compounds uh, where people lived, uh, bombing uh, government uh, buildings, etc., trying to assassinate police officers, etc. So uh, that also entailed the uh, not only security measures to oppose these uh, these acts, but also trying to, to invigorate um, uh, public and, and, and uh, uh, civic action against the, the terrorists, and trying to elicit from the community itself uh, opposition to, uh, to them. And fortunately, any, the subsequent successes that we had against these groups uh, came because of the society itself, uh, people reporting suspicious act uh, actions or individuals and the police investigating and finding that there was something being done there. And alhamdulillah, and we managed to prevent many uh, potentially uh, um, dangerous and bloody um, terrorist acts through that. Uh, and one of the responses later on developed was this Mohammed bin Naif Center which you're going to visit, is to try to reach out to the ones who had not yet been, if you like, uh, um, uh, infected by, by the disease of terrorism or, or extremism and so on, and, and to, 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 to get them back from, from, that, uh, from that course. So th that, that, if I can, I don't know if you... If you you're younger than I am, so maybe you can tell something more. <laughs> okay. Great, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Your Royal Highness. Um, I'd like to ask, what is your biggest criticism of American uh, involvement in the Middle East post 9-11? Um, I could go on forever, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, not just American, but any, I have any, a lot of criticism for ourselves and for others. But uh, I think um, after 2001, um, I would say um, that uh, America's so-called war on terrorism uh, developed into uh, a, um, a, an unstoppable um, uh, and uh, basically uh, a never-ending story. 
where uh, America's commitment to fighting uh, terrorism and the world community joining in that will have to continue to, to engage in, in, in acts like, uh, for example, taking out terrorists, uh, uh, terrorist uh, operatives. Uh, yesterday, I think there was a, an attack on, on, on Somalia where 50 people, I think, or 30 people were, were killed. Uh, and uh, inevitably, there is going to be collateral damage with these activities. I'm not saying that there is an alternative to that. But I think giving it an open scope, as such it is, um, you're bound to, to follow whatever happens everywhere and take, take on the responsibility of engaging worldwide on, on that issue. Um, I think it would have been smarter to identify the enemy at that time as being the Laden and the Qaeda. And so when inevitably uh, Bin Laden was, was finally gotten, if you remember a few years after 2001, um, I think that was the time to declare victory. There was a previous opportunity, which was when Bin Laden was on the run in Afghanistan in 2003, uh, or the end of 2002, in Tora Bora, up in the mountains, in, uh, and uh, American uh, special forces were chasing him uh, and his, uh, his uh, allies uh, in those mountains. But all of a sudden, that campaign was stopped, and all those resources were taken away and given to the campaign against Saddam Hussein in Iraq. Um, that, I think, was a huge mistake. Uh, and uh, the, the, the campaign against Saddam, whatever the justification for it, uh, definitely it turned out to be based on, on fabricated intelligence about the presence of, uh, of uh, chemical and uh, other weapons of mass destruction in, in, in Iraq. So that was a huge, huge uh, error uh, in my view. Uh, and uh, taking out Saddam in the way that he was taken out uh, I think was uh, was wrong, and then mistake upon mistake. Once the military campaign ended, basically the the whole bureaucracy of Iraq was abolished. So it left the country completely uh, open to whoever wants to take advantage of it, and uh, unfortunately, those who took advantage of it were the extremists on both sides. You had the, the people who set up Al-Qaeda and so on, as I mentioned before, pouring into Iraq and using it as a platform for their own purposes. But you also had Iran across the border uh, pouring into Iraq uh, and, and taking advantage of the absence of uh, any uh, government structure to uh, establish their foothold in, in Iraq, which is a giant foothold, basically. Um, so that, I think, those errors um, have led to subsequent uh, problems. Uh, in Syria, of course, inevitably, the red line statement by President Obama was a huge mistake. Uh, and not going forward and, and, and doing what was needed to be done. Um, so, and that's why today we see uh, the Russians in, uh, in, uh, in Syria, the Iranians in Syria, Bashar al-Assad still in Syria, still killing Syrians and uh, creating a huge humanitarian crisis there. So these are some of the, I think, mistakes that, that America have, uh, has committed uh, in, in our part of the world and basically negligence of the Palestinian issue. I think uh, 
wherever you go, it all leads back to Palestine. Uh, all these groups, Qaeda, Daesh, uh, the Hezbollah in Lebanon, uh, the uh, former dictators in various Arab countries, etc. To them, the Palestinian issue is, is a banner headline that they raise whenever they want to justify whatever action they take. And so you have, for example, the Revolutionary Guard, Iranian Revolutionary Guard uh, uh, military uh, unit that is dealing with issues in our part of the world is called Al-Quds Brigade, Jerusalem Brigade. So they use these, these uh, marks to identify with the Palestinian issue. I see Kasha is, is holding the time for us here. Yeah, we're going to leave soon to go to Mohammed Bin Nag Center and get okay. some lunch well, first. So thank you for listening to me. I hope you'll come back and next time I want to listen to you um, <laughs> if that is possible. And please, if you can feed back and send us uh, any, any ideas, comments or views on, on any subject. Uh, don't hesitate to do that. You have our emails here in the center. Of course, Kasha and Nelika, of course, will always be a wonderful channel for you to communicate to us and other, uh, vice versa. And thank you for being with us. And uh, today we are on television, so uh, we have documentary proof that this meeting took place. <laughs> we cannot deny it. So you're most welcome. Thank you very much. Enjoy yourselves and enjoy your trips. Prince Turkey, could we just take a group photo with them? Yes, of course. Yeah. We were outside. Um, or in front here. of the logo. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah.